<laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Greasy. I'm Director of Standards Development and Sustainability Initiatives for TCNA, Tile Council of North America. And it's our uh, pleasure today to uh, introduce this 9.30 session, uh, Wednesday, first day of the show at Coverings, uh, on environmental responsibility and human wellness, hot topics in green building and how the tile industry fits in. And, and we'll get into a lot. Um, this is formatted as a panel discussion, so each of the panelists are going to give uh, a short uh, presentation and then we'll have a lot of good discussion. But before we get into it, uh, a couple housekeeping items. Turn off cell phones to vibrate, please. Uh, and this, as a reminder, uh, you'll want to complete the session evaluations in the mobile app and we would love your feedback. Uh, the CEU information is all uh, available at the back of the room. Ask the room monitor for assistance or visit our North 220E room, which is the speaker ready room, with any questions. Uh, and also, you'll, you want to scan your badges uh, to confirm your attendance for CEUs and, and all of the certificates. Make sure you have your badge scanned. You can visit the Coverings Lounge, booth 3919, for more educational opportunities. Okay. Having said all of that, uh, today we are going to talk about human wellness, not just human wellness, but also environmental wellness, uh, sustainability, green building in general. And we have a lot of good stories to tell from the tile industry, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but before we do, do so, I'd like to better understand the audience. Um, actually, yeah, sorry. I'd like to better understand the audience. Do we have in the room, what, how many of you are suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, retailers? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Any designers in the room? Mm -hmm. How about installers? Mm -hmm. Consumers, users? Okay, good to know. I think we're all consumers to some degree, right? It's true. So now that we know who you are, let's meet who we are, who the panelists are. Um, starting in the, from right to left, I guess, we'll go with Mr. Dan Marvin, uh, who is Senior VP of, Iron, of Operations at Iron Rock, the leading manufacturer of extruded thin brick, also Royal and Metro Brick, and Quarry Tile, Metropolitan Quarry. Dan has been in the tile industry for over 30 years, with stops at American Olean, Dow Tile, Florida Tile, and Mapei prior to his arrival at Iron Rock. Dan's also active with standards development groups and industry trade groups such as NTCA, TCNA, ANSI, and ISO. He's a frequent speaker at Coverings and Total Solutions Plus and many other trade shows. Uh, we also have Mr. William Paddock. Uh, William Paddock is founder and managing director at WAP Sustainability, a leading provider of sustainability initiatives, services that include carbon accounting, life cycle assessments, toxicological assessments, product transparency programs, and supply chain sustainability services. Uh, William serves as ecosystem partner for the International Living Futures Institute, Living Product Challenge, and is current chair of the Lead Materials and Resource Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, William is also a board member of the Carbon Leadership Forum and supports the Health Product Declaration Collaborative, HPDC, as a member of its technical committee. And then we also have Ms. Holly Henderson, of H2, the founder of H2 Eco Design. Holly's also known as the common sense environmentalist, making sustainable choices make sense for your business. She's author of the book, Becoming a Green Building Professional, a frequent speaker on sustainable design issues. Holly has presented at, for many groups, including conferences, professional associations, academic institutions, and corporate audiences. H2 Eco Design has facilitated several firsts, including the very first lead for commercial interiors project in the US, which was a platinum building, and in China, which was a gold uh, level building. Uh, also facilitated the very first lead project in Thailand. Uh, beyond buildings, H2 Eco Design collaborates with a myriad of associations and building product manufacturers and facilitates their green path, including education and communication. For over a decade, Holly has served the National US Green Building Council, chairing the Market Advisory Committee and the Lead uh, for Commercial Interiors Core Committee. At this time, she serves on the board uh, of the International Facility Manager Association, Environmental Stewardship, Utilities and Sustainability, community, community as chair of both programs. Uh, you're, you're also, Holly has also um, sits on external advisory boards for Well Building, uh, Wells Fargo, and Contract Magazine. So very, very impressive resumes from all of our panelists. So just to talk about today's discussion, and then we'll get right into it. Uh, we're going to talk about green building, and, and Holly's going to kick off uh, with a talk on just what the priorities are in green building landscape, what designers expect of manufacturers and suppliers, and, and also talk about the health and environmental criteria that are in green building standards, codes, and rating systems. Uh, then we're also going to talk about 
uh, the tile industry and what our toolkit is. Dan's going to talk specifically about some of our tools with standards, certifications, transparency reports, and other ways to specify tile. And then William's going to um, elaborate on the, the material ingredient initiative that we recently com completed. Then we're all going to talk about how we can collaborate as an industry a lot more, some of the things we can be doing because we have a lot of great stories, so we need to get the message out there. And, and we want to collaborate with the design community uh, to continuously improve the stringency of environmental standards, sustainability standards. So with that said, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Holly and, and let you kick us off. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bill. I'm going to dismount, you guys. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Woo! Okay. So I'm so excited to be here today and to talk a little bit about trends, transparency, and traction. So with that, let's talk about trends. One of my favorite things about this industry is that we actually look at trends forecasters. So I saw one of my favorite presentations from a trends forecaster. And someone in the audience asked her a question. They said, how do I stay ahead of the trends? And I loved her response. Her response was, go download three pieces of music you would never listen to in a million years, and go buy three magazines you would never buy. So basically, get out of your current surrounding and really get outside your own box. So when I look at the great galaxy of trends, and there's a lot of trends forecasting out there, some of my, the ones that rise to the top for me are resiliency, science, and safety, and social. So for resiliency, I looked at Gensler's forecast for 2021, and if you do a search within their forecasting report, you're going to notice nearly 20 times they mention the word resiliency or resilient design. Now, what do they mean by that? They mean the ability to adapt, the ability to be flexible, no matter what happens with the climate, no matter if you have a pandemic, it's that ability to be flexible and to design ahead for that. They also talk about how we've had to be really resilient across multiple market sectors. I'm guessing you guys all work across multiple market sectors. So resiliency in terms of healthcare design, education design, retail design, even in our homes. But they talk about the infrastructure of resiliency not only in the built environment, but also within the people space. So our workforce also has to be resilient. The second big trend we're seeing is the science trend. We're all more interested in data now. So while energy has been a big focus for many years in terms of the environment, what I've noticed with the pandemic is that the air has become visible. And air quality is a big concern. We've all got these masks on our face. We're much more focused on it. Did you know over the next 24 hours, you're actually going to consume 15,000 liters of air, which is four times greater than the food you're going to eat and what you're going to drink in the next 24 hours? So I've had the great pleasure of collaborating with a research team that works specifically on air quality. Chemical Insights, which is a, a research institute that's a nonprofit um, piece within Underwriters Laboratories. And what we're gonna, I'm going to show you in just a minute is a case study where they actually take natural materials versus synthetic materials, and we're going to see what happens in this experiment. Uh, but it's made me much more aware of the air quality dynamic. Then the third big trend we're seeing is safety and social. So from two different perspectives, so from Forbes, which is business financial side, they're saying they're seeing a huge increase in social responsibility across the C-suite. So the C-suite, CEO, CFO, or what have you, is seeing a 75% increase on social responsibility across the last five years. Also from salesforce.com, which you may use in your company, which is a CRM or a contact relationship management tool, um, they're saying in order to win, talent in the hiring business in terms of recruitment and retention, you've got to be focused on social responsibility. So I think it's really cool to talk about trends, but I think what's even cooler is to be able to apply the trends to real life application. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at one case study very quickly focused on fire, which wildfires are a piece of the resiliency equation. We're going to look at natural versus synthetic, and we're going to bring it home to the personal space as well. So with that, look at these two different um, case study scenarios. So what you see is you see on the natural side, it's a completely natural living room, or what I like to call currently my office. And so it's all natural materials, right? I mean, everything from cotton to silk to stone to tile to wood, what have you, is all natural in that scenario. And then the synthetic scenario is all synthetic materials. So they lit the couches on fire. They did four different research studies, and what they found was the synthetic side actually burned within less than five minutes with that, co with that combination of materials. 
the natural side took up to 30 minutes to get to full flashover burn. So you begin to realize from a specifier's perspective that sometimes we make um, decisions because we think it's the greenest decision, it's the quickest based on marketing or what have you, but oftentimes it's a regrettable substitution. So just keeping that in mind as we do our specifications and really looking at more data. We want more transparency. So let's move to that section. So for transparency, what have we done historically as built environment specifiers, installers? We have, oops, oh, this one's not going for it. There we go, okay, good. So um, we have looked to third party green building rating systems such as LEED. LEED is the one I'm gonna focus on right now. Oops, sorry. So focusing on LEED, because that's the one we predominantly focus on in this industry. We know there's other systems out there. There's WELL, there's FITWELL, there's Green Globes. But what you might have noticed is LEED is turning. It's trying to turn the whole industry and make a huge shift. Do you guys remember, I can't hold this, let's see if I can do this. Do you guys remember that old school EPA triangle that was like reduce, reuse, recycle? So they brought the industry into LEED by recycle content. They knew that was something we would all understand inherently. You know, you have this aluminum can, you throw it in the recycling stream, it comes back as something aluminum. They're trying to shift the entire industry now to look at three different dynamics because they realized that was singular and silo dimensional. So now we're trying to look at life cycle health and social. So I'm gonna show you is one new lead credit within each one of these categories, if you will. So for the different tools that they are using in order to demonstrate life cycle and health are much like calorie counters you see on the side of your food, nutritional labels. So what are they doing for nutritional labels in terms of our building materials? So we've got a pyramid here. The bottom two thirds are what we're calling EPDs or environmental look at materials. Um, and then top one third is health. So if you don't look at these together, you're not getting the complete environmental picture or environmental plus health picture. So now we, let's look at a life cycle particular credit to lead. And what we find is that we have within the materials and resources category, I didn't even know you were the chair of that. That's really cool, by the way. Um, so, so credit two is um, environmental product declaration um, focused on EPDs. So option one is EPDs, and you know that you have to have 20 products on your project across five different manufacturers that are willing to have an EPD to demonstrate the life cycle of their product. Um, the second option, this is kind of a new way of approaching this, is they focus on the embodied carbon. Now what does that mean? That means the transportation associated with that material, that means the manufacturing process associated with that, that material. If they are willing to have an action plan that's separate and distinct from that LCA and that EPD across five different products and three different manufacturers, you're able to gain that second option. So now let's look at the health side. So for health, what we're noticing is, this is one of my favorite credits. It looks like it's kind of scary from the outside when you start reading through all the language, but it's actually pretty easy to understand. So option one, it's really looking at that material ingredients for product manufacturers. And it says, are you willing to just open the closet and let us see what's in there? No matter how scary it might be, you might have some really bad things in your closet, Totally cool. If you're willing across 20 different products and five different manufacturers to show us a thousand parts per million of the chemical ingredient materials within your product, you're golden for a point. Now the next level is tougher. So material ingredient optimization. Now can you organize the closet? Can you approach your suppliers and say to your suppliers, hey, can you get me a different, you know, a different material? Can we do a substitution here, what have you? Are you willing to clean and organize that closet? And that is five products across three different manufacturers up to 100 parts per million by the green screen um, by weight. So now social. So if you had a new credit that you wanted to show within the lead system, oh gosh, I think we're going too fast here. We got, we got multiple clickers going, you guys. Hold on a second. Back up just one more. Oh, is it me backing you up? Have that I'm backing up. I have this. Boop, 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 <laughs> boop. And it's not working there. Yeah, because I don't know what your light is. I want to be on uh, this slide. Yes. All right. Okay. So lead pilot credit. So if you had a new lead credit you wanted to bring into the lead system, you would put it into the pilot credit library. And they would beta test it across multiple projects and look at the documentation and see if it worked. Then if it works, it becomes a real lead credit, just like Pinocchio, a real boy. So they have this particular social equity credit that looks at different scales of social equity or social responsibility. Community scale, project scale, and product scale. If we look at product specific scale, if you have 75% of your tier one suppliers by cost that have a code of conduct. Now what's a code of conduct? Code of conduct is basically your willingness to say as a company, 
These are our sustainability business ethics. We're not going to have child labor. We're not going to have discrimination. This is how we work. So this is free to do to create a code of conduct. So beginning to ask for these code of conducts can create an innovation credit for any variety of lead um, projects. Last category is traction. And my favorite thing about traction is it's actually got action within the word. So here's a checklist of things that you can take from here today on the things we just talked about and use in your next project. So first is resiliency. Consider things that are durable, that are long lasting. Those are the things that you want to focus on for your specifications. Also consider natural versus synthetic and those regrettable substitutions. Also, we didn't talk about this a lot, but the Rely system, which is actually a different um, rating system that um, the GBCI or US Green Building Council houses that focuses on resiliency. It might help you in your next architectural A&D interview. Science, download the Well app. You might say, you know what, I'm kind of interested in that Well rating system, but I don't have time to learn about it. They have an app that you can download to your phone and while you're waiting for lunch somewhere, just learn about it. Use Mindful Materials. This was fascinating. Mindful Materials is an aggregator that pulls together all the different EPDs and all the different material ingredient transparency. It's free. It's all housed in one place. It's free to designers and manufacturers. But this was really fascinating. And A&D, um, Mindful Materials looked at how much time is wasted in A&D firms doing research on materials and not being able to find the right green material. 40K, $40,000 a year is wasted in wasted material research. So check out Mindful Materials. And then the last category, safety and social, ask for a code of conduct or could create a code of conduct for your company. And then also my favorite thing is download this Charity Miles app. So if you do any kind of exercise at home, if you run, if you walk, if you swim, whatever you do, download this app and they will actually donate to charity you just doing what you do to exercise. So thank you guys so much. Thanks, Holly. Here, I'll give you that one. So, as you can tell, we have a very elaborate system of clickers up here. But hopefully, we're all on the same page. So, I'm going to let you in on a little secret that isn't really a secret. Manufacturers pretty much do what we're forced to do. So, I'm going to get into a little bit of the manufacturing side Sorry. of what? Adventures. I'm on the wrong slide? How can I be on the wrong slide? I'm the actual <laughs> presenter. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so manufacturers are going to do what they're kind of pushed to do, what they're driven to do. And for sustainability, that push started coming 20-ish, you know, 15 years ago with lead version. In particular, 2009 was a big driver for us in the manufacturing community. And Bill and I were tasked kind of in 2008 time frame to put together the tile industry's response to a lot of the things that were going on in the state sustainability community. So we really had to try to figure out who are the drivers in the market. At the time, it was mostly lead. Now, as you can see from this slide, there's a bunch of different people that are asking a bunch of different questions. And so we've been trying to put together a way to intelligently communicate what the tile industry has to offer. And really, I'm pleased to announce that the tile industry has kind of gone above and beyond and gotten past this, you know, we're only going to do what you force us to do mindset into, we really kind of want to lead the charge. So at the beginning, we were very reactionary. We were saying, okay, what's the carpet industry doing? What's Biffman doing? What are these other organizations doing that we need to emulate? And we've gotten to the point now, especially today, which I'll get into in a minute, where we're really starting to lead that charge. So these are kind of the groups that are driving it. And then these are kind of the questions as manufacturers that we're getting on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we sat down and started to sort through what do we need to put together for the tile industry to answer some of these questions, the obvious starting point was what questions are we getting? Quite often they fit one of these categories. What's, can you fill out this lead checklist? It's got you know, eight or nine different things that manufacturers can actually give to an architect or a designer that helps them get lead points for their project. Do you have an EPD, an environmental product declaration, which Holly talked about, and also the HPD, the health product declaration. And these things oftentimes get into uncomfortable territory for manufacturers because we're kind of giving away the, the secret sauce sometimes. We're, we're telling our competitors what's in our product or we're telling the market what's in our product. And that's uncomfortable for my boss. It's uncomfortable for, for everybody's boss in the manufacturing world. So there was a little bit of internal lobbying to get the information that you're all asking for in a way that you can use it. And then, <coughs> excuse me, 
On this last bullet point, there's a lot of kind of onesie twosies that are a little harder as manufacturers to answer because we don't get them consistently. But they're, they're things that are very important. What's your recycled content? Do you have a certification for that? Uh, how much greenhouse gas emissions are, is your product bringing along for the ride? Uh, those, the life cycle cost of your product. Are you using local materials? Some of this stuff is still from the old version of LEED that we still get those questions. So they're, they're things that are important to whoever's putting that project together that are kind of part of one of these programs, but sometimes they're just curious. So we're putting together a package now for the tile industry, and that's not just tile. So it's tile, it's mortar, it's grout, it's in some case membranes and backer boards and that whole system that it takes to get tile in the place where you want tile. That approach hasn't really been uh, taken on by some of the other competitive industries. You won't find that for vinyl or for carpet or any of the other flooring industries because it's a, it really opens Pandora's box on some of those chemicals that are in adhesives that we don't really have that issue in the tile industry. So not only was this an effort to answer the questions, it was also an effort to really highlight what we do very well. So the first thing I talk about is performance. And under the performance category, we put together a multi-attribute um, sustainability standard for tile, mortar, grout, adhesives, that sort of thing, that was called green squared standard. And I have a slide on that in a minute. Under transparency, we're getting into what's in it. So the environmental product declaration, the life cycle analysis of the product. And then finally, this last piece of the puzzle is the optimization. That's the, the health impacts of the product, the HPD. So we've got these kind of three legs to our stool that we're putting together for the industry to try to be leaders. First up is green squared. Now green squared is a neat standard because it really takes a look not just at the product but also at the company that's making the product. So if you get this green squared certification, you've had somebody actually in the facility looking around, poking through your, your papers and making sure you're doing what you're saying you're doing. And it was also when we put it together a roadmap for how to do things better. So the whole idea behind Green Squared wasn't just, you know, tell me the, the stuff you want me to hear. It was, here's what the sustainability industry says is important. Um, for instance, Holly had a slide on, on that social aspect of not using uh, child labor and forced labor and that sort of thing. Those are all things that we have to document to get Green Squared certified. So it ties in really nicely with some of those credits that she was talking about. And normally this is an hour long presentation, so I apologize, I go pretty fast and throw a lot of acronyms in here. That's just kind of the, the alphabet soup that is sustainability, but um, there is a question and answer period, so please kind of note down what your questions are and, and shoot them at us afterwards. Um, the EPDs, the Environmental Product Declaration, this is based on the entire life cycle of our products. And it's not just for tile, again, because LEED is looking for 20 different products from five different manufacturers. You can knock two or three of those off the list just by putting in a tile system, which is great. So we did the industry average EPDs for tile, for mortar and grout, so you've got a whole package that you can go and start to hit some of these LEED points. Today at 801 this morning, the tile industry announced a material ingredient guide. So what is a material ingredient guide? Why do you care? The material ingredient guide is really our approach to how do we get this HPD, this health product declaration, as an industry. And we got into kind of a gray area because no one had done this before. Um, we took all the industry data and aggregated it together into one document that says, here's what's in tile, here's what's in mortar, here's what's in grout. And the nice thing is we're starting to lead now. We're no longer just following the pack. We're starting to set the standard for what it is to be a sustainable industry. You're going to see a lot more of this. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it except to say I participated. I know a lot of the other manufacturers in the room participated. And this was not an easy discussion, but because we had had those hard discussions on Green Squared and then we had had them again for EPDs, it became a lot easier discussion to go to my boss and say, hey, now we need to disclose this stuff, boss. And they're like, fine, you, know, it's your, you, you greenies, go ahead and, and do what it is you need to do. So because we've set that stage, things are becoming a little easier to get you the information that you're asking for. Material ingredient guide, this is one for a specific product, so much like the EPDs, we're doing kind of an industry average and then manufacturers can do their own specific one. And it just tells you what, the, what each of the ingredients are in that product and then some of the health impacts for those. And I won't spend a lot of time on it, but there's a lot of information embedded in here. 
One last area I wanted to touch on is communication. So it's great to have all these things, but if nobody knows what they are or where they are, it kind of falls on deaf ears. You can't really have any traction in the market. So this is where uh, Kathy and Y Tile uh, do a great job in trying to promote this, this idea of tile is sustainable, tile is green. So this is one of the slides I've taken out of hundreds of slides that can be found on the Y Tile page, can be found in the TCNA uh, green guide. This is just global warming potential. This is how much of that embodied energy is, is in there for tile, and we kind of think of this as a negative because you're, you're heating tile up real hot, but then if it goes in a building and it sits there for 70 years, in the meantime you've replaced your carpet three times, those effects become additive where tile is just tile. It's just, it's been there the whole time. So that green bar at the front, that's actually the, looking at the big picture compared to all the other flooring behind it, and tile doesn't really have as bad of story as we think. So there's a lot of stuff in there that I can't really unpack in, a, in a 10 minutes. But I do want to say, go to Y-Tile, go look at some of these web pages that we've put together for you, because all that information is out there. And Bill and, and the whole TCA team has done a great job of explaining why it matters and, and why we have it. So again, kind of our three, our three legs here. We want to be transparent as much as uh, our bosses will let us. We want to be transparent with you about what it is that's in our products. Uh, we want to show you that we have performance, environmental performance, and also that, that health and ingredient guide part of it. So that's my section. I'm a double shoot here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Holly, I really appreciated your, your comment there about uh, songs and magazines. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that for, since you've said that. And, I played this 4th of July play mix, and uh, the first couple songs were, I can see clearly now, was one of them. And then this banger, uh, Ace of Bass, I Saw the Sign, good song. And then I went to the magazine thing, and I looked that up, and I grabbed a couple. And anyways, you know, I, I grew up in a small suburb in uh, southern Ohio, and it seems these magazines now, people are wearing a lot less clothes than they used to. <laughs> Then I had an automobile magazine, and they had this thing filleted open, hood open, underneath, you know, shots inside, and it hit me. <clears throat> I think transparency might be the trend. Um, <laughs> and I think what you heard in, uh, in, <laughs> in the intro here is, is that there is a trend around transparency. Uh, people are interested um, in the things that uh, go into the products that they use in everyday life. Uh, yet alone a building. Um, there was a stat pre-COVID that people spent like 90% of their time inside. And I think during COVID, that number sort of increased. Um, and so people were interacting um, with, with uh, building products in their homes uh, more than they ever were uh, because they weren't going to work. They weren't going into the office every day. Uh, health, I think, became even more of a, a theme. I mean, I, I literally am a critic of hand sanitizers now. You know, there are certain ones that I can't stand the smell of and others that I'm like, ooh, Purell, let me grab that while it's on the shelf. <clears throat> you know, I, I, people who have never cared about health can tell me health, give me health advice for the first time in life. So, uh, the, you know, trends are changing. The green building certification programs that were kind of referenced, LEED, Living Building Challenge, WELL, uh, most of these have, have been programs that have been uh, targeted to the commercial building space. Uh, I think the, the stat is 85% of building projects, over $20 million, use a green building rating system, like LEED, Well, Living Building Challenge. Um, for, for the first time, we're seeing uh, those programs, because of, I think, some of the post-COVID activity sets, uh, find their way into residential uh, projects. Um, we're working with some residential home builders, some military housing, some affordable housing uh, uh, groups who are are being pressured by investors or stakeholders or the federal government, uh, if, if they're in the military housing, to, to know and, and understand the ingredients that they're putting into to homes. Uh, no military home builder wants to be uh, testifying in front of Congress why they use building materials that uh, you know, are, are harmful to our troops. And so as a result of all this, the, the market mechanism that we're seeing is that customers are asking manufacturers for material ingredient uh, information. Um, and they want that in some common formats to fulfill some purpose. And so 
this, this is all kind of riding on the coattails of right to know legislation. So I think like nutritional labels are a great example of that. You know, just because that bag of pork rinds has 2,000 calories per serving doesn't mean I'm not hungry for some pork rinds. Um, <laughs> but at least I make that conscious decision when I purchase the pork rinds. So one of the challenges as transparency evolved is that the approach to being transparent actually isn't as simple as you think. Uh, different, uh, we're talking lots of standards, lots of rules, lots of requirements, thousands of pages of, of guidance, uh, you know, acronyms and part per million and the thresholds and all this other stuff resulted in a little bit of confusion about when we're talking about something like tile, as an example, what do we actually mean? And, and what, what is tile? And so we, we, we saw in, in doing this work that different manufacturers were approaching this differently. Some were saying, hey, ceramic is all a, a continuous fused item, and so I could just be, be uh, transparent and say, you know, my tile is ceramic material. Sort of like saying a cake is cake. But maybe I'm more interested in the flour, sugar, and eggs uh, that went into the cake. And so maybe the mixture uh, approach was an approach. Maybe I disclosed, um, you know, cake uh, by saying it has flour, sugar, and eggs. And then maybe some architects, designers, interested parties were really more interested in more. Like, what's in the flour? Because flour is not just one thing. Flour actually has all these other things. There's vitamins and minerals and other stuff that Duncan Hines tells you in their, in their cake mix. So, you know, explaining that out a little bit more like it looks like on the side of an ingredient label. So what we, what we realized is that in order to really have a maximum benefit, to be most transparent, to meet the needs of most of the people to Dan's point, it, you kind of had to move into some uncomfortable territory and understand substances. And what are all the substances that are included that go in to make the tile? And so the opportunity was if, if everyone could align around that or we could present tools and resources, what an impact that would be if one industry was just uber transparent. The solution was to kind of help build that. So we, we needed to understand the approach, we needed to break it down, we needed to provide examples. And so as, as Dan mentioned, the 801 announcement today was to launch this material ingredient guide, uh, which talks about a couple different steps for manufacturers to, to walk through, provides a lot of guide. Uh, and, and resources, uh, explains the approach for, each, for users, where we're inventorying, screening, and assessing substances, or dis there, there's ability to disclose that, and then optimize. Um, and you know, examples for manufacturers to use to pick up and see, hey, uh, I kind of need to make my uh, disclosures look like this in order to have uh, maximum benefit. The, the outcome of this is that Within those green building certifications, the market mechanisms that we're talking about, the people asking for this type of information, is there's usually a carrot on the other end of the stick. And so uh, people talk about lead points or contributing to lead projects. And, and the rules within the lead rating system uh, credits that Holly introduced uh, provide a lot of opportunity for manufacturers to do this effort and then have their products um, contribute at higher levels than really any other industry. Um, so manufacturers that follow this will have products that contribute at, you know, almost two and a half uh, product weight. So, you know, you know double uh, what, what standard products would do. And, and if you caught some of the, the point credits that Holly was mentioning, basically an architect or designer who needs this credit and lead can basically just do it with tile on tile setting materials. So they don't even need to look at another industry. Um, and I think that's pretty amazing. Um, I, I think an aligned approach that makes it easy for people to find uh, products that have these transparency documents, uh, having transparency in tile uh, be synonymous, uh, I think it would be an amazing outcome uh, that comes from this. The, the guide is available. You can shoot your camera at this QR code um, and, uh, and, and be able to download it. I think one of the things that struck me in this whole, whole work was, was, you know, we work around a lot of different uh, materials and, and, uh, and manufacturers and different industries and, you know, tile really has a lot of ingredients that I can pronounce. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a, uh, a chemist, 
and some of those uh, words for chemicals that we see in other industries are a little complicated to pronounce, but you know, I can, I can find a way to get out s s sand, you know, and <laughs> c c clay, you know, I'm, I'm s cement. I'm, I'm, it's stuff you've heard of, so we, we've been saying, you know, it's, it's uh, ingredients you've heard of and names you can pronounce. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Great job, William. So I think we're going to change the pace a little bit here and, and, and open it up for discussion among the panelists and, and you know, questions from the audience. I think we're going to make this as casual and informal as possible. So if at any time you have a question, raise your hand, we'll get you a microphone. But I think just, just to get the conversation started here, I'd like to turn right back around to Holly because you heard everything that we've got going on in the industry. Um, and you're as tied into the green building you know, needs of architects, designers, and, and kind of what the trends are. So I'm curious, your just raw feedback on tile and, and how, how you perceive what we're doing, if it's on trend, do we have a leg up on the competition, just kind of where we stand as an industry. Well, I have worked a lot in the flooring industry in particular. I used to design carpet a long time ago. Um, and so I, I have seen a lot of the sustainability realm from a flooring perspective. And I know tile has other applications other than flooring. But um, I'm really intrigued by this. I think that it is a step up. It sounds like, and I'm curious from these guys, the kind of courage, how long did it take you to convince like the manufacturers, you know, because I think that's really one of the big things I'm seeing is it takes courage to open up that closet and get in there and clean it out and look at the suppliers. So it sounds like to me, you guys have really done the work. Yeah, I'm pretty you know, sure it was about three years ago that <clears throat> Bill and William and I kind of had that first conference call of is, is this doable mm -hmm. and how do we get everybody mm -hmm. kind of on board with putting out the material and grading guide. So it's been, it's been a, a long time coming, but it's been a, a worthwhile exercise for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say the tile industry is in a very fortunate position because inherently we have as William said, products that are, there's not much to hide um, uh, with cement, with tile, and, and, and some of the other installation materials. And inherently, we have a good story to tell with the durability and it's long lasting. And William, being the green building expert, he is located in tile country in, in Tennessee. So a lot of manufacturers have, have, have had a, the privilege of getting kind of two steps ahead of what's going on in the industry. I'd have to say, too, the biggest slide that made the biggest impact for me, I think, was the one you showed with the LCAs mm -hmm. and the bar chart. And I was like, if you can look at the long-term application mm -hmm. and you see that the long-term application shows the smallest footprint, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah. I think, Dan, what do you think? I mean, we have all of the, we, we, I guess we can call it our tile industry sustainability toolkit now, where we have a standard and certification, multi-attribute standard and certification. Uh, for t all tile materials, tiles and all insulation materials called green squared, and that's the environmental performance at a, in a standardized format. We have transparency on the environment with three industry-wide EPDs, and we now have all of the guidance and assessed, industry-wide assessed chemicals for, for the ingredients most commonly used in tile, mortar, and grout. So we have all the tools for manufacturers to go out there and sell, sell to the um, green and healthy building uh, projects. What, I want to ask you, Dan, what's next? You know, how do you yeah, put this in action? I think you touched on it. You know, the key then is now to sell sustainability as part of the tile package. You know, it's not just the color of the tile or the or the yeah. pattern. It's all these other all these other elements that come along for the for the ride. And you know, our, our challenges are the industry doesn't pivot real quick, but sometimes the sustainability community does start looking in different directions. So, you know, what, this was a three-year effort. So if the sustainability market says, no, now you need this, it takes us a while to get there. What are your thoughts, William? What are our biggest challenges in front of us? Yeah, I, I think you've, uh, the adage of, you know, lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink comes to mind. You know, like uh, in order for these, you know, uh, outcomes to happen, right? For tile and transparency to be synonymous, you know, manufacturers have to respond and do uh, do, do their stuff and they have to tell that message as well to, to customers like so all the, the buyers and, and pr you know promoting that transparency not only in the commercial building space but also in you know in retail with you know other retailers um, that you know buy tile and, and sell even in the distribution uh, side as well so I think that message has to permeate across the industry and then it's really one of those things that uh, you know that effort should you know all, all, all cream should rise to the top. 
Um, so it's, I don't think it's anything new and innovative that has to be done. It's just doing the things that have already been laid out well. So, so to that end, you know, kind of moving forward, at, I think we're well positioned, and it's no secret in the room that the tile industry, one of our biggest competitors today, uh, is the plastic flooring industry with vinyl tile and, and some of the other vinyl flooring options. Um, I want your raw feedback on just how are we doing compared to, you know, uh, on this front, or what opportunities are there for us as a natural uh, material to go out there and now with all the transparency and, and compete? Well, I, I, I think it kind of goes back to the, I'll, I'll pivot to a football analogy. You know, I'm, I'm an Alabama guy. I know you're a Clemson guy. So, you know, Nick Saban's message is do your job. You know, that's what he tells every, every player in every position. Do your job. You know, you don't have to go out and do something magical. Just if everybody does their job, then, you know, that's how we win all these national championships, uh, more than Clemson. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I think it's that. I think, you know, I think the ability to compete against, you know, other flooring types is, you know, the strategy has been set up. You know, if you do your job, talk about transparency, lead with that to a health-minded, you know, consumer base, that should play well. Um, you know, you might, you might pick up some hardware uh, doing that. Uh, I'm not going to dignify that comment with a response. <laughs> and I have no clue. I went to Auburn in the 90s, and I was like, Bo who? What? Barkley, huh? Yeah. So, Holly, you know, I think we t I loved the kind of pandemic tie into all of this because it, it seems that, you know, we have the pandemic, a lot more attention to human health. We have a new administration, so a lot more, I, I think, government focus on, on carbon limits, and that's going to trickle down to the private sector. Um, I think this all affects everything we're doing. For better or worse, uh, we have an opportunity as an industry. So do you want to comment a little bit on just kind of the landscape today, you know, where we are, you know, what, what we see in the future, kind of? How we're positioned. Definitely. I see a big emphasis on carbon. I see a big emphasis on embodied carbon we talked a little bit about today. Um, I think as an industry, you're really well positioned, especially against some of your competitors. Um, I think that one of the other things that you've done a good job of is making it easy, because it needs to not only be easy for the specifier, but also for the manufacturer. So if you can make it just kind of plug and play and with that material guide, I think that kind of gets back to the communication piece you mentioned, William. So you can great, create all these great tools for the industry, but if they don't use them and people don't know how to talk about them, um, so it kind of gets back to the, the pandemic in a way because it's we're all communicating in a different level, talking about health, and the ability to communicate about these green materials I think is really important. Dan, what do you, what do you see as kind of the next big thing? I mean, you, you said, can I fill out my lead sheets, you know, all these. Do you, what other requests are you getting? Um, anything different today than it was five years ago? For sure, we're seeing a lot more sophistication in the questions we're getting. Five years ago, we were doing a lot more teaching. You know, this is this is what we have available, and here's why you care. And now that's been that script is getting flipped to where it's okay. Here are the things I care about. Now, Mr. Manufacturer, tell me what it is you have that can that can address these things. So in that sense, you know, it's great because the market's starting to catch up to to a lot of the things that you and I have been working on, and William been working on for years now. They're they're starting to to find their groove, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the manufacturing organizations, I do say that we need to do a better job of getting our salespeople comfortable with this messaging. Uh, quite often, I, I think the, the questions that they're getting asked, they aren't comfortable in saying, oh yeah, this is, you know, we've, we've got an HPD here and here. We've got this material ingredient guide here. This, fit, this will meet your HPD requirement. Or we have an EPD, here it is. You know, those, those tools are available, but we have to do a better job. And, and some key salespeople grab it and run with it, and that's great. And then they need to kind of take that to the rest of the sales force and say, this is why this matters and, and how we can go from here. So we, we have some suppliers in the room, you know, um, presumably um, sales teams that are, that are trying to do exactly what you're saying, and uh, admittedly it's confusing. I don't know if, William, you wanted to take just a few moments to just expand on the material ingredient guide, what that means in terms of, you know, tile, and now that we have this guidance to release material ingredient information, what does that mean for lead projects, well projects, uh, living building challenge projects, and how are we in an advantageous position now uh, based on some of these thresholds for the point? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the good news on the, the, 
the outcomes, so we'll start with the you know, LEED, Living Building Challenge, and WELL, is all of those uh, certification programs have a whole category for transparency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the currency to sell products into that, you know, 20, you know 85% of projects over $20 million marketplace, you know, this is part of the currency to get into those, to those, uh, uh, get into those projects. Um, and then, you know, what, what are the requirements for transparency? And so I, I think, um, you know, that's a, that's a longer conversation, but all of that is unpacked in the guide. So, you know, if, if I'm a manufacturer, Santa, or I, I'm somebody interested in how to get into those uh, verticals, the guide sort of walks me through what credits, what contributions, what level, and then, you know, where, what are my options for, for you know, uh, product documentation or, you know, level of disclosure and other things. So, the, the guide really walks through maximum contribution, but it shows you the steps of, you know, here's the basic contribution, you know, if that can't work, then, you know, here's another option to, to basically elevate that. And so, uh, you know, let me just take one for example. There's a, a credit and lead that Holly showed for optimization. And the idea is that uh, disclosure is this notion of, hey, I'm just gonna list all the substances, and then optimization is defined as I had toxicological assessments done on each substance and there's some scoring and other information that comes with that. Historically, to, to achieve that credit, every manufacturer would have had to pay separately. Mm -hmm. And so the same substances would be assessed over and over again. What Tile Council organized with a group of manufacturers was, you know, hey, let's all just crowdfund and share cost. Mm -hmm. And so the outcome was significantly lower cost per manufacturer, but an, an option to uh, have all this information available. So all that's there to set up these, the, the assessments draw this optimization credit. And all it takes is five products to earn that as an architect or designer. So just five products, like one manufacturer with four different styles of, of tile could get me almost there and then add in a, add in a grout that complies. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that's, it's so simple. Five products is not yeah. complicated in a big old you know, $20 million uh, building. So I think just, you know, if there's enough content for the, uh, the specifying audience to find from, from tile and, and tile setting materials, this is, you know, this is a layup. Yeah. No, that's important because in a lot of these, optim these points for optimization in green and healthy building, there's very little participation from industry, from suppliers, because manufacturers just don't want to pay the, Ten to fourteen thousand dollars per product to assess all of their chemical, probably more than that, to assess all of the chemicals in the product. So we found a way as an industry to do all that work at the industry level. So we have a library of information, and manufacturers that participate in the project can draw from that library. And so now, if you have a health report, a material ingredient report for a tile, one for a mortar, and one for a grout, that's three products in your twenty million dollar building out of the five that are required. Oh, and by the way, if there's a different tile and a different mortar and a different grout in the elevator, you've satisfied your five product requirement, which is the very first, um, you know, we're one of the first industries to be able to uh, say that we're contributing at that level, because like I said, there's very little participation uh, from other, especially floor covering industries. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. I want to maybe ask one more question to Holly and then turn it to the audience, but maybe, can you be honest with us? What, what's our weaknesses as an industry that you can observe? Well, let's see. Hmm. Uh, weaknesses, let's see. Um, I think still being able to talk about the energy side of things, being able to talk about that um, in a smart way like you did, Dan, and like being able to explain that, um, I think that would be, I think another thing too is um, you know, durability and the trade-off with things that are in buildings a really long time and how does that work with aesthetic and things like that, you know, being able to talk about um, the durability long-term. Um, what else would I say? Challenge, a challenge, a challenge. Well, so how, have, has, have all the ingredients been revealed? In the entire industry, is there not any, there's not any percentage that you're looking for? Okay, so there's, that's, not a, that's not a weak point. All, all at the, you know, as many that are common among the okay. industry. Um, every, some manufacturers may have the remaining 5%, you know, that's mm -hmm. unique to their product that it just didn't make sense to crowdfund at mm -hmm. the industry level. So that may be something that, mm -hmm. that will encourage manufacturers to do is shoot for that extra 5 to 10%. Mm -hmm. You know, it won't, won't be required for the lead credit at this point because we've, we've assessed the vast majority. Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, in the spirit of transparency, I think that is something you know, people might start asking for. Yeah. But that's a really small thing yeah. in comparison yeah. to all we've talked about. The hardest part is understanding and getting going. So now that we've started, I think, as an industry with this, manufacturers kind of are in the groove and, and have, a, have a template to, to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for the other manufacturers out there, you know, the next step is to take that material ingredient guide for your products and, and yeah. do that, those product specific ones. And it was a fairly painless process. You know, Williams Group came back with a couple additional questions about some ingredients that we didn't, didn't initially have to disclose because of those threshold levels, but we do because it's just our product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal at all. So it is, I think, a blueprint for other industries. We hope other industries will uh, take a similar approach, um, and this is a continuously evolving thing, and we'll continue to, to reach back or to, to move forward and look back on what we've done, but um, always look into the future. Mm -hmm. I want to turn it over. Are there questions from the audience or questions online? Any comments? Yes, ma'am. So we're a manufacturer. Oh, thank you. We're a manufacturer. We actually take tile and attach a magnet to the back of it and put it on top of our access floor so that customers can get access below the floor to all the infrastructure of the building. And we've focused a lot on the lead part of it, so we, I feel like we've got that all really well responded to. We're starting to s focus more on the social side, and I think we're doing a lot of the things, but is there anything that you've seen out there that's a good way to sort of present it to the marketplace? Like you mentioned, a, a code of conduct. Is there any kind of a really good, you know, like we've got HPD for, for HPDC, for, for promoting HPD. Is there something like that that we could look at for the social side of it to really respond to that well? That's a great question. I mean, I'll throw out a couple of ideas. One is code of conduct. I mean, when I worked on those for a, a manufacturer, we basically looked at a bunch that we just downloaded from across the industry. We just looked at a lot of them. We looked at the criteria that LEED requires in that innovation, that pilot credit. And we just blended them together, making sure we met the criteria. And we just created, it was a Word document. I mean, it literally took a day, maybe, to put it together. It was so easy. So that's code of conduct. I'd also say you could do a just label. That might be one option. Um, and then another one would be, um, oh, you guys, B Corp. Look up B Corp. You'll see that even on your ice cream at the grocery store. They do kind of a reporting card of how you rate in terms of social responsibility. But do, can you guys think of other ones? Well, I was going to, we, we did a presentation on this with uh, USGBC uh, last year um, under, the, they have a program called Better Materials. And so one of the purposes or one of the potential outcomes of transparency is that it, it highlights sort of the difference between, you know, where in the chemical value chain is, you know, chemicals of concern happening. So, <clears throat> you know, this, this may be a, a good nugget for some other, uh, in, in discussions about transparency with other industries, but, you know, uh, chemicals in the, uh, a product in the building may be called inert, all right? And so, uh, but in the supply chain or in a, you know, in a fence line community with low income people where there's a chemical plant making a, you know, a polymer of sorts, um, you know, releasing uh, chemicals of concern into that um, disadvantaged area you know, is a challenge. And so that was the correlation between the HPD and transparency and sort of empowering uh, decisions about, you know, what's happening in the supply chain. Because, you know, there's, you know, there's, I don't think there's a lead building in Demopolis, Alabama, right? But maybe there's a chemical plant uh, there. And, uh, you know, those sort of impacts are, are really more uh, global. So, I, you know, I think that, that was a, a tie that, you know, disclosure and, and providing that information to people to make decisions about social, uh, social issues is, is a, a, a great example as well. Great question. Mm -hmm. Got a few more minutes. Any other questions from the audience? So just, I, I have a few closing thoughts here. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the durability of tile and, and the ability to last 75 years almost off, offsets every environmental burden that we can mm -hmm. think of. Uh, a challenge we have is making sure we have products that people want to keep for 75 years and that, you know, it's only going to, you're only going to realize those benefits if it lasts, it's only going to last that long if, if the, you know, building owner, um, tenant, um, whatever, wants to, you know, maintain that flooring. I think we're in an advantageous position as an industry because the product innovation, and this I think is where the beauty of the products, the, 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 you know, the innovation of the products are exciting and it's, it's products that you know, people want to keep in their buildings. And I think that's the challenge we have as an industry is to promote that heritage of tile. Mm -hmm. um, Eric Astrakhan, our executive director, uh, likes to say a lot of times that 
some of the most significant events in your life happen in a tiled room. Weddings, uh, think of churches, think of receptions, think of, you know, just major, major events. Having a baby. Having a baby, yeah. <laughs> not, not, you know, it's more of a sterile um, application of tile, but certainly. Um, but, you know, my point being that we celebrate tile as something you want to keep forever in, in some of these magnificent installations. So I think, um, you know, as we think about competing on the health and environmental side with, with the vinyl industry in particular, um, you know, you see a lot of emulation of tile products and you see tile emulating stone and, and wood, but I think tile is unique in that when you have a tile that looks like wood, you don't try to hide the fact it's not wood, you're actually kind of proud of it. You tap on it and say, hey, that's kind of cool, it's not really wood. I can't think of other industries that like to tap on and say, hey, you think it's ceramic tile, but it's actually plastic. Isn't that cool? So I think that, that we, have a, you know, we have an opportunity to get these messages out to celebrate tile. Um, oh, and then we'll realize uh, the, the, the environmental benefits and the health benefits in the long run. Mm -hmm. But you know, as, as I was asking the question, Helen, I was thinking that is one of our challenges, I think, is to realize the environmental benefits. You know, it, has to last, it can last that long, but we have to make it last that long. I think that's something to, to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Dan, any final thoughts from industry? Well, I mean, uh, timeless classic quarry tile uh, there is you go. typically uh, lasts forever because no one wants to replace the back of house, but you know, that's, yeah. it's neither here nor there. No, from the industry perspective, you know, we continue to be interested in whatever concepts you want to bring to our committee. Um, you know, to, to Bill's point, we've we've kind of crossed off the biggies and now it's time to, to start looking for what's next. So if there's something you're getting a lot of questions on that you'd like to have the industry help you respond to, please reach out to us and let us know what that is. You know, we, we certainly uh, meet regularly as a committee and can consider any of the, any of the ideas that are coming in. So, um, you know, let, let us hear what you're, what you're struggling with. All right. Any final thoughts, William or Holly? I'll let it lie. Uh, All right. Yeah. I'll say I'm impressed. I'm impressed, right, really impressed. So, uh, and, it's, and I honestly haven't worked in the tile realm probably 10 years or so. So it's interesting to see it flash forward and see the progress that's been made and see the courage that it's taken. So. All right. Well, thanks for the kind words and thanks to all the panelists. Um, it was a good conversation and look forward to talking more. The big news of the week is our material ingredient guide. So you can stop by the TCNA booth to, to find out more. We'd be happy to share some, some more information with you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.